Thank you so much for having me. First of all, I'm super excited to be at FETC and to be with you recording this podcast. And like I already said to you, I love like looking out, like we're looking at all the people coming in and out of FETC. Absolutely. And it's so fun. I'm just like, I want to do this all day. Can we just sit here and chat all day? We could do it all day. Yeah, absolutely. I could do that. Yeah. I mean, I do have a session I have to go to, but (laughs) in between. Do it virtual. Log in. Right. (laughs) Log into the Uh, Wi-Fi and just go virtual. Yeah. Yeah. So I am Kristen Brooks and I am a technology specialist in Cherokee County School District, which is located in... um, Georgia. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, but I teach up in Canton, Georgia, so a little bit outside the city. Okay. And yeah, I um, work with kindergarten through fifth grade students every day. So I taught students yesterday before I flew here. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, we do a lot of creating in the tech lab, creating with all kinds of devices, all kinds of tools. That is what we do. And we have a lot of fun. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you. First and foremost, thank you for being a part of the show. I remember at FETC 23 last year in New Orleans, I remember I was walking by the table and I saw you recognize you and we chatted briefly. I think you were getting ready for a session. You might yes. have been eating at the same time. I think um, I was. <laughs> and you were like, oh man, I'd love to be on the show. And, and I had kind of already booked my slots for FETC 23. Um, but you were literally the first person I thought of when I started getting um, spots filled for FETC FETC 24 live in Orlando. Yes, Orlando, Orlando is where it is at. Yes, it is. Yes, I mean, it is. it is really busy right here right now. And it's only going to get busier. I know. I mean, the Expo Hall isn't even open yet. I know. Yeah. So. And we're right outside the doors of the Expo Hall. So. Yeah. We're going to be doing a lot of judging, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, girl, look what she is wearing. No, I'm just kidding. We are not <laughs> judging. We are waving at people because I just, I love seeing yeah, people. Yeah, absolutely. I love seeing my, my, my EdTech family. Yeah, it is. So it's like many, a reunion. It is because so many people live all over the country, different countries, and yeah. they're all, a lot of them are here at FETC and... It's just fun. Yes. Yes, it is. It's, it's good old fashioned, the good old fashioned F word, which we can't say in education anymore. Fun. <laughs> right. right. But I do say that a lot in my classroom. I'm like, hey, friends, we are in the tech lab to have fun. Controlled fun. Con- yeah. But fun. Yeah. Like, I like that. Education and learning is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be, you know, sparking curiosity. There we go. Which is going to get to our topic. <laughs> what a perfect segue to our topic here. And that wasn't even planned. No, no. It's all natural, right? It's all, uh, it's like sprouts and uh, all those organic markets. It's just yes. a natural organic conversation. So with that being said. Yes. You are, you've already presented a couple sessions and you've got a couple more. But we're going to talk more about creativity. I'm sorry, not creativity. Creation over consumption. Mm-hmm. Do you have any sessions on this? I, it is woven into all of my sessions. Okay. Just all right. So at the heart. For those of you who are maybe watching or listening, if you had to define, and you don't know what the, the terms are, if you had to define consumption in, in what were the context of educational technology, how would you define consumption? Consumption, in my opinion, would be using a device to, you know, read something, to gain knowledge, uh, maybe to watch a video. You know, you're just, you're taking in from that device. You know, that's good. There's nothing wrong with consuming from devices. How about creation? Creation is using that same tool to create a product. Now, it is usually a digital product of some kind, but that can still be, you know, printed or sent out, shared with other audiences. You know, it's not just because it's in a device, it just stays there. That's another thing that I'm kind of big on is when my students, whether they're children, elementary, middle, high school, adults, if they are creating something, I want it to be shared out, not just staying local on a device. And what I love about what you just said right now is... I literally had this conversation with uh, some seventh grade English language arts teachers at one of my campuses that I support and we're working, big pie in the sky goal is to have the students create something for a larger, I don't want to say global audience, but a larger audience. You know, you, you go from the individual to the teacher, to the classmates in that particular classroom, to the campus level. Yes. And we want to share it with admin. We want um, comments, input from admin, 
peers and other teachers as well. And I truly believe that when you start putting the student work creation to a larger audience, they start putting their best foot forward. Oh, they do. I mean, even just within your same, because I, you know, on a daily basis teach kindergarten through fifth grade. Every day I see all of those grade levels. And when my fourth and fifth graders are creating just for me, it's like, eh, you know, a few minutes. Here you yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and put this in, um, you know, Canvas now. Yes. But, Turn it in, get my but credit. But when I say it's going to be, you know, we're going to put it in Flip, and it's going to be for your peers to see. Oh, that's a whole different story yes, if it it's is. for their friends. Or if I say, hey, we're going to share this. I, one thing I love doing is having my older students create knowledgeable items for my younger students, maybe to explain a holiday that's coming up or to explain something from history. And it's like a little teaching moment for them to teach a younger student. And we share that with, you know, QR codes. Sometimes we actually have them go into those classrooms and share it with those younger oh, students. Okay. And that is huge because when those older students realize, oh, little friend on the bus that looks up to me is yep. going to be looking for my QR code because the younger students are like, where is this class? Where is this person? Yeah. You know, so they are looking for that older influence to see what they created. That is when I get the best work out of my students. And, and that requires a lot more critical thinking on the student's behalf. Mm -hmm. If I'm creating something at the surface level for my teacher to see in whatever learning management system that I'm using, I can probably regurgitate some information. I can Google stuff or Bing it if you're in a Bing uh, Microsoft uh, environment. Mm -hmm. But if I'm now told you're going to take that piece of information and you're going to transform it into a presentation, to a teach piece for the first graders down yes. the hall, it's like, oh, God, I got to know this stuff. Yes. And if my peers are going to see here and maybe evaluate what I'm doing, yes. I can't look. I can't look stupid in front of my friends. I can't look like I don't know what I'm talking about kind of thing. So, right. yeah. Or even, I've even had some, it was the sweetest thing. I, my first 10 years, I taught first grade for five years and second grade for four years. Okay. And, you know, as a homeroom teacher. And one of my fifth graders, when they were creating something for first graders, he was like, um, I, can I can I go and look some stuff up, some facts? Ooh, he and got I was nervous. like, I said, well, sure. You already know this. You already learned this in your you know class, your regular ed class. And he goes, oh, I know. I just want to double check my facts because my first grade teacher's gonna see it. Oh, and I was oh, like, oh, his first grade yes, teacher. Yes, yes. I love that. And I, it, it literally like my, I was like. Oh, you can go look up whatever you would like. Because I was just like, that is the sweetest. I mean, he was concerned. He wanted to make sure he taught the students. But also his first grade teacher was going to see that. Oh, my gosh. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's now, sweet. I completely forgot to mention this. Yes. You are officially on the Ed Tech Bites podcast. On the show. Yes. We break bread together. Okay. And I just happen to bring some bread. You have one of my favorite breads, okay. actually. So... <laughs> You get your first pick wow. at one of these uh, power rings, as I call yeah. them. Oh. I don't like to call them the D word because that has a, a, a dirty connotation to I it. I love a power ring. I Wow, these are challenging. <laughs> I'm going to choose this. All right. Sounds good. I am going to. <laughs> Did I take yours? No, no, no. I think I'm going <laughs> to. I'm, I'm just going to. I have to pick one, one of these power rings and kind of eat it throughout all my episodes. Uh. I can't take down five donuts right. that's not going to happen right so i got to pick one and be strategic so i'm going to grab it. this chocolate cake donut mm -hmm. and i'm just going to kind of uh, nibble on it all day as okay. i as i interview people but yeah and, and for those of you listening if you want to be a part of the show mm -hmm. because you get a free donut then yeah. by all means and they smell amazing they smell, I, I had i didn't make them i know but they, but they smell amazing i mean you can't go wrong yeah yeah <laughs> man this thing just broke apart in my hand there we go all cheers right. cheers let's make it official mm. Cheers. Mm, there we cheers. go. All right. It's delicious. <laughs> Even a bad power ring is still... You can't have a bad power ring. It's still good. Right. Yeah. All right. My students actually know this, that I cannot say no to a power ring. Like, my, they know. Yeah, my whole family, all my friends, they all know me by that. And honestly, I only eat them, like, maybe three, four times a year, mm -hmm. realistically, because I know how bad I am. But they're special. Yeah. 
What's your favorite? This one. Chocolate glaze? Yes, chocolate glaze oh, is okay. one. Of, and the one that you picked is also, I kind of have two. Uh, I have several favorites. Also the one that has the chocolate inside of it, like the white powder. Did you oh, see yeah, any yeah. kind of look? Yeah, yeah. I was looking to see, like, is that jelly or is it the chocolate filled? Yeah. Well, uh, well, <laughs> come back to do another episode later, and I'll, I'll have that one ready. For you. <laughs> and I'm going to have more tomorrow as well. So, um, oh goodness, my favorite is the. How many uh, episodes can I do in the week? <laughs> we could just do this all day. Hey, how's it going? Um, but uh, my favorite is the apple fritter. Ooh, oh, that's a good gosh. one. It's a good one. You can't have a bad day apple after an apple fritter. You can't. It's, it's no. impossible. Okay. All right. So, see, we got so sidetracked. I love it. I love this conversation. We got <laughs> people all around us. But what are some things that you do in your classroom to foster that creativity and student creation? I do tons of things that I, I hope it's something like outside the box because I want my class to be a little bit original. Okay. So I try to do, you know, every year I don't do the same lessons over and over again. I recreate them. I, you know, finagle them differently. Um, I will say that my favorite things for my students to create is usually something with photographs or with uh, video. Okay. I, I love when they are creating those things. Um, to me, it, it takes the abilities up a notch. And, and then they're having to remember things that we've learned, you know, maybe like some green screen there and adding go. that in, you know, just kind of my students, though, they love an app smash. Okay. Dun, now, dun, dun. <laughs> for those people who are new to this concept or have never heard that term app smashing, define app smashing. App smashing is when you create something with one app. And then you take that creation and pull it into another app to create another product. To add to it, to yes. keep augmenting. Yes. I'm just using big, big old state testing words today. <laughs> augmenting. Yeah. So, for example, I might record something on the camera of my iPad or my phone. Mm -hmm. I can then pull it into what's one of your favorite uh, uh, filtering? Clips. Clips. clips app. Okay. I might throw it into the Clips app to... Uh, make it vertical or mm -hmm. maybe add some text to it and then after that what might I do with it? You could then take that and put it into um, let's see a lot of times we'll do like we take photographs then we pull those into clips and create a video but you're adding in you know emojis on it and wording on it and telling more of a story. Okay. We've also done where my students will then go and make a stop motion video maybe with oh. Legos and okay. add that into the Clips app. So you're just you're getting all these different media items that they've created and making one movie out of the different creations. And it's all from that building block of the original video. And then the smashing part is pulling it in. Um, not smashing. Smash or mash? Smash. Smash. That's I right. mean, that's what that's the term I use. I've heard I've heard <laughs> them interchangeably, yes, like yes. app mashing, app smashing, and you just keep adding stuff to it through uh, various yes. apps, and then it eventually goes into a learning management system mm -hmm. or some sort of curation um, tool or resource Correct. that way they can share it with uh, classmates, mm -hmm. a global audience, or what have you. And one, my students they love Minecraft. That's, oh, that's my next it? session at 11, 11 a.m. I saw that. Yep. I saw that. And we did. Um, an activity, we've done it a few different ways now, but we did one where it was probably, I feel like one of my most favorite over the 20 years that I've taught Ed Tech, favoritist. Most favorite, yes, yeah. favoritist, um, is that um, we, they created a story setting in Minecraft, and then they walked through that story setting, and then they took that into Flip, where they were recording them telling about it. So they like made that two separate things and then they basically were smashing it all together I so that it. they could share that then with their peers, their family, whoever wanted to see it. But it was like basically like a book talk. Okay. But their characters walking through the setting that they created as they're talking about it. I did that with Texas history. No, yeah, no, I'm sorry, U.S. history. U.S. history where we created the Virgin, um, was it, I forgot the settlement. One of the first settlements on the East Coast. Virginia? One of those. Well, we, we, we found a pre-made map uh, in Minecraft and then just kept adding to it and nice. created this, this robust city where 
they had to create the agriculture to sustain Ooh. their their colony, like and then they had to um, they had to do a bunch of stuff. Livestock. What happens nice. if it rains? You got to keep them covered, and <laughs> so on do. and so forth. So uh, we assigned groups and did all that stuff, and it was just it was just so awesome, so awesome. I have a question for you. Okay. And I know that some people out there either watching or listening might have the same question. So my question to you is, if I'm a teacher who has primarily focused on the creation aspect and not mm-hmm. necessarily, I'm sorry, the, the consumption, not necessarily the creation. Yes. And I'm ready to take those steps to become more of a teacher who fosters the creation rather than the, the consumption, but I'm hesitant. Mm-hmm. I'm scared to take that dive. I'm not sure if I'm going to do it correctly. What is some advice that you can give a teacher who's ready to say, you know what? I have been focusing on consumption. I need to step my way up to creation. What are some, what's some advice you can give? Absolutely. I love that question. Thank you for asking. I feel like a lot of educators that that is hard because as an educator, one, a lot of people, it, feel like they need to be the smartest person in the room, which is not in anyone's contract anywhere. So <laughs> drop that. Don't don't put that extra pressure on I've yourself. I've never heard that. I love that. Um, it's not in your contract. It's not. And I say that a lot in my sessions. You know, just that's extra pressure you're putting on yourself. When I started with Minecraft, I, I could look at it and tell, I mean, this is many, many years ago, that students were going to love it. I mean, it's a game. It's, it's made for them. It's a gaming, but you can learn from it and you can do so much with it. But I was like, I do not, I'm not a gamer. I don't know this game. Yes. And I was just like, hey, friends, they were all fifth graders. We were a pilot group. I said, I know that y'all love Minecraft. And they're like, whoa. And I said, but Miss Brooks doesn't know Minecraft. So if I agree to be part of this pilot, can y'all help me learn this game and teach it to me it was hard to say because I'm like I mean honestly the night before I was like do I really want to do this you know I was a little nervous because what are they going to think yeah you're making yourself vulnerable but they did not think anything they were like yeah Miss Brooks we got you no problem (laughs) you know we'll teach you every I mean I learned so much in the first several weeks like four weeks honestly I had to get a notebook and start writing it down because this, you know, every time we would be creating something and building something, they were like, "Oh, if you do this, and you can, you know, now go to the crafting table." And I'm like, "Crafting table? What's that?" <laughs> you know, and and they taught me. But it was a great one experience for me because I realized it didn't matter to them what I if I said I knew everything or I didn't know anything. It, that did not change their perception of me. Two, and that was really refreshing. Two, um, also. Hey, <laughs> Jen Womble just ran by. Um, Two, it was great because it gave students that honestly didn't always want to stand up and share a chance to stand up and share something they were very knowledgeable about and okay. very passionate about. And that was really eye-opening for me that I was like, wow, this child just that is like in their wheelhouse and they are loving being able to explain it to me, to everyone, because when they would have something they wanted to share it was like open mic they would just get up and just share it and they could go on the Promethean board or whatever board you have in your room and share it and explain it and I would say oh you got to look at the audience you got to have you know a loud voice like I do that kind of thing and so it really gave them that you know authentic opportunity and that was I feel like huge for me to see and witness but I can't imagine I feel like it was super huge for those students as well okay all right so if I'm interpreting what you said, it is, you don't have to be, the, make yourself vulnerable. Yeah, you don't have absolutely. to be the smart, you don't have to pretend you know everything. Right. Lean on the students. Hey, lean, lean on the students for input for, to help teach you about a specific yes. tool, app, resource, or, um, is that you? It is. Oh, so man. sorry. Um, about something that maybe you don't know, but can, you can probably learn from that way you can help facilitate the activity in that and then just give them that, give them the creative steering wheel. Yes, because they will love it. Okay. And I mean, I feel like it gives them a more vested interest in... The buy-in. Yes, totally, for your class, whether you're with them all day or once a week, you know, they were super excited, like, what are we going to do next? You know, with yeah, Minecraft, yeah. what are we going to build next? Okay. So, 
I, I feel like that's an easy way and it makes it fun for everyone. Yeah, I totally agree with that. <laughs> okay, I know that you have a, another session you got to hit up. How can people find you on socials? On social, I am at Kristen Brooks 77. So it's K R I S T E N B R O O K S 77. Okay. And I have one final question for you that I ask of all my guests on the show. Yes. Corn tortilla or flour tortilla? Oh, absolutely flour tortilla. Flour tortilla. Okay. <laughs> I'm team corn, but I respect a good flour tortilla. All yes. right. That sounds good. Well, um, thank you guys for tuning in. But yes, more thank importantly, you. thank you for the opportunity to kind of break bread with you and discuss the creation versus consumption and going into more creation over consumption. And once again, uh, a big shout out to our sponsor, Lightspeed. For this episode, to learn more about Lightspeed, please visit www.lightspeed-tech.com. Anything else you'd like to say to the guests? Thanks so much for tuning in. I appreciate you and all of you educators out there. You are doing amazing work every day. So thank you for showing up and for being there for your students and everyone else in your building. And thank you so much for having me. This has been a true pleasure and delight. And I absolutely love it. And I want to come back. Let's do it. Let's let's make it happen. All right. Well, thank you very much. Have a good rest of the conference.